The Trail of the Serpent, Signs, Stars and 666 by Merle Vance. Astrological Mysteries Unveiled. Editor's Introduction. The future has been a point of interest from many perspectives, including the theological, political and the personal. For without it, theology becomes hopeless, politics becomes nihilistic and personally unfulfilling. Man has a right to know the future, but can he know it without any supernatural aid? Astrology is man's futile attempt to understand the future in relation to the planetary movement. But can we believe it any more? Is it valid for the postmodern humankind? Is it scientific? Some have argued with a certain amount of explanatory coherence that there is no significant correlation between the birth date of an individual and the position of the planet. Recent investigation confirms that it no longer matches with traditional correlations. If that is so, are there any other attempts that can guarantee predictive power? While man has a right to know the future, he cannot fully know it unless his knowledge is linked with a higher source of understanding. But how do we get in touch with it? Did you know that God alone knows the future? But he doesn't leave us there. He has shared part of his knowledge with the human race. It's called the revealed word of God given by the influence of the Holy Spirit. This revealed word has predictive power. It clearly states what to expect and what not to. It outlines the rise and fall of kingdoms, especially of a power that will speak great things against the Most High and wear out the saints. This power has been identified and the roots of the movement has been traced historically. It is interesting and surprising to see the subtle means adopted in maintaining its identity. Intensive study into the origins and meanings of the mystic numbers has conclusively proved that the name of this great human force is working against the forces of light. Merle Vance attempts to show how a study of numbers can open our eyes to the deeper meanings of astrology and the symbols which early societies used. The Trail of the Serpent deals with the exclusive phenomena of numbers, but from a different perspective. It goes beyond the numerical value. It exposes the reader to indological insights and makes comparisons worth considering. It examines the relation between the stars, signs and the exclusive number 666. It compares the associations with the origins of the mystic numbers employed in esoteric societies. It carefully weighs the secrets behind pagan societies and shows how it still exerts its unseen influence on us today. It also explains the sacred uses of the mystic number six and shows its link to the serpent, phallic and sun worship. The author shows in a convincing manner the distinct connection between the number 666 with the symbolic forms of early societies. His arguments are worth considering. Is the sixth letter of the English language a descendant of the serpent hieroglyph? Are all the alphabets a direct descendant of the serpent of hieroglyph? Is there any relationship between the word sex in Latin and the word six? Is the coming of the Anglo-Saxon word Friday a counter move by the pagan forces to undermine the creation of man? Frigia is the name of the goddess of love and marriage. Is nature worship in reality the worship of the devil? Does the number 666 apply to the beast and to a man? These, among other questions, are some of the crucial correlations that Merle Vance attempts to explore. His conclusions are biblical and leads the reader to confirm the identifying marks of the man of sin spoken of by Daniel, Paul and John. I trust that this book will not only strengthen our faith in the apocalyptic literature, but also help us to be alert to see the difference between the genuine and the counterfeit. Edison Samraj, M. A. M. Phil. The Trail of the Serpent, Chapter 1, The Origin and Meaning of Mystic Numbers. An understanding of the symbolism involved in sacred numbers provides a most interesting key for unlocking many of the mysteries of pagan rites and ceremonies. 
It also unlocks the mysteries of ancient, medieval and modern secret societies, as well as the mysteries of the Church. By her own admission, the Church has woven the threads of heathen cults among threads having a Christian nomenclature to produce a universal or Catholic religion which embraces all religions. No sacred numbers in Scripture. In introducing this subject, one should understand that there are no sacred numbers as such in the Scriptures. At no time does the Bible speak of a number by itself as sacred or worthy of veneration or worship. The Scriptures state that mankind should worship one God, the Creator, but they do not state that man should worship or fear or venerate one or seven or twelve or any other number. In each case where numbers are used, whether literally or symbolically, the number seems always to be used as an adjective, with the noun expressed or clearly implied. That numbers are used symbolically in the scriptures no one can deny. The number seven, for example, became a symbol for perfection or completeness, a symbolism based upon the creation cycle of seven days and perpetuated to this day by the weekly cycle as a measurement of time. The seven-branched candlestick in the sanctuary, the seven churches of Asia, and probably also the appointment of the seven deacons were all commemorative, it would clearly appear, of the creation cycle. But there is no evidence of any veneration of a sacred seven, or of the seven-branched candlestick, the seven days, the seven churches, or the seven deacons. Another number used symbolically in the scriptures is the number 12. The children of the 12 sons of Jacob were organised into 12 tribes on the march to Canaan, and the organisation of this wilderness church was unquestionably commemorated by Christ when he chose 12 apostles to assist him in his work, just as it is also commemorated by the city that hath 12 foundations, the new Jerusalem. But 12 as a number, we note, never has any sacredness of itself, nor do the scriptures ever speak of twelve gods. The same may be said for any other symbolic numbers used in the Bible. The numbers may suggest certain ideas in connection with God's work or his church, but at no time do we find numbers as such with any sanctity. Sacred numbers originated in Babylon. Sacred numbers are a characteristic of paganism and have their origin in Babylon, where every god had his sacred number, and the number was used frequently in place of the god's name, or even as the name itself. Four universal languages. Before one can understand the reason for the considering of a number as sacred, one must understand the oriental penchant for symbols. It has been said that there are four languages in the world the spoken language, the written language, the sign language and the symbolic language. Of these four, the language of symbolism is the greatest according to symbologists because it is universal and can be understood by those who have studied it regardless of one's native tongue or even of his ability to read and write. To a large extent, sign language really belongs in the latter class. Though all peoples use some symbols to express ideas, symbolism as a sacred language seems to have originated among the priests of Babylonian and Egyptian temples, from whence it spread to the remainder of the world with the migration of the various peoples as they spread abroad on the earth. The ancient religious mysteries of Babylon, Egypt, Persia, Greece and Rome, as well as those of the Gnostics, medieval churchmen and modern secret societies such as Masons and Rosicrucians, for example, all have symbolism as their secret language and all claim to be universal or Catholic. In every case, the symbols used are intended to conceal from the masses secret meanings known only to certain select initiates, secrets which cannot be revealed without peril to one's life. Men's minds are intrigued by mystery and it is ever the purpose of the mystery societies to lead men on and on, ever seeking but never coming to the real knowledge of the truth. The secret of the mysteries. 
Let us state right here that the sole secret of the mysteries is the identity of the God being worshipped and the meaning of the various rites, symbols, holy days, vestments, etc. used in that worship. It has ever been the aim in the mystery religions to load every symbol with as many meanings, each being complementary, as possible, and to dangle ever before the initiate the fact that further study and money will be necessary before he is in possession of the true or deeper meaning. Thus, though symbolism is said to be the universal language, the depth and the breadth of the meaning of a particular symbol may not be equally comprehended by all. This is as true of number symbols as it is of pictorial symbols. One thing is certain in seeking an understanding of symbolic language. Whether numbers or otherwise, the student must go back to the religious texts, art and pictorial writing of Babylon and Egypt in order to obtain the keys. With this study he must ever bear in mind the fact that a knowledge of the fall of man by means of the serpent, the flood, a coming saviour, and the final destruction of the world has ever been the common heritage of man wherever found on the earth. Threads from the biblical story, distorted by ignorance and soiled by the greed of a corrupt priesthood, are to be found interwoven in all pagan religious fabrics. The Essence of Demon Worship As the sons of Noah, following the confusion of language at the Tower of Babel, spread abroad over the earth, they carried with them not only the facts of man's early history as told to them by their fathers, but they also carried forth a new principle of religion, that of attempting to placate the evil one, the cause of all their miseries and misfortunes, by sacrifice and appeasement. The principle behind the devil worship of ancient Babylon is the same as that taught by the open demon worshippers, the Yezidis of Mesopotamia today. The object of worship, they say, is not to show love for a good God who always shows love towards his subjects, no matter how they regard him. It is to placate and try to secure the favour of the angry, destructive deity by offering him sacrifice, penance and worship. This is the principle necessary to the understanding of all pagan and apostate religions, as well as of the sacred numbers used as symbols of each of them. 666 more than the title of an apostate leader. Bearing these facts in mind, we can understand the significance of pagan number symbolism and, we believe, before we have finished our study, we shall understand fully why the number 666 is used by the Revelator to describe the beast and the man who is his earthly representative in the apostasy. As a foundation for this understanding, we shall discuss the pagan use of sacred numbers, including the use of the number 666, and the connection of these numbers with the astrological demon worship of Babylon, and of the nations which have been drinking of this contaminated fountain since the time of Babylon. We do not reject the finding of 666 in a title of the individual who fell heir to the religion of Babylon and who heads the apostasy, but we believe that the use of this number in this connection can be substantiated on grounds far stronger than in the title alone. We believe that once the evidence has been examined, all questions as to the revelator's use of this number will be forever settled in the mind of the student who would have a reason for the hope that is within him. All Astrology from Babylon all sacred numbers, without exception, seem to have astrological and therefore Babylonian connections. All scholarship agrees that Babylon was the home of astrology. There is far more to this subject than many believe, for though all religious leaders of antiquity did not believe that the planets controlled the destiny of mankind, as widespread as this concept was and is, all the chief pagan gods of all nations, without exception, will be found to be, in their final analysis, the gods of astrology. When we find the sun god as the ruler of the zodiac pictured on ancient temple as being with hoofs, horns, a tail and a pitchfork, when we find the frank admission that the church during the medieval period was largely controlled by astrology, when we find the zodiac carved on the papal throne and everywhere in her art, on her staffs, 
church windows and on her cathedral floors. When we find popes pictured in authorised publications, seated on the zodiac, and each with his private astrologer, then we have a foundation for applying the sacred numbers of astrology to the individual who heads the system and to the whole organisation which has gathered up all the threads of ancient man's religion were to be gathered up, none being lost. Introduction to the Egyptian Religion, Shorter, pages 125 and 126. The Trail of the Serpent, Chapter 2, The World's Oldest Living Religion. There are only two religions in the world. One is the worship of God and the other is the worship of Satan. The latter is the foundation of all pagan religions and all apostasies. Satan has ever craved worship and has succeeded in becoming the God of this world. Matthew 4, 8 and 9, Deuteronomy 32, 17, Psalm 106, 35 to 37, 1 Corinthians 10, 20. Revelation 9, 20 and 13, 4. Satan is busily laying his plans for the last mighty conflict when all will take sides. Satan is working to the utmost to make himself as God and to destroy all who oppose his power. And today the world is bowing before him. His power is received as the power of God. Men cherish the attributes of the first great deceiver. They have accepted him as God and have become imbued with his spirit. In his visions of things to come, the prophet John beheld this scene. This demon worship was revealed to him, and it seemed to him as if the whole world were standing on the brink of perdition. But as he looks with intense interest, he beheld the company of God's commandment-keeping people. E.G. White, Testimonies, Volume 6, pages 14 and 15. Demon worship disguised as nature worship and centering chiefly in the sun began in the astrological region of ancient Babylonia and has continued unabated from that day to this throughout the entire world. It has at its basic principle the placation or appeasement of the evil deity. It is a religion of fear and represents an attempt to avoid his destructive powers by becoming his servants. The cosmic or universal religions of the world combine the worship of God with the worship of Satan, a combination which Christ declared is impossible. Matthew 6, 24 The astrological religion of Babylon is as much alive today as it ever was. Though astrology as such was dethroned in western lands, it still rules supreme in the east, and even in England, more people consult astrologers every week than go to church. And everywhere, mixed in with the professed worship of God, we find the teachings, the symbols, the rites, the holy days, and the disguised gods of devil worship. Says the agnostic Brown in This Believing World, page 285. It is not correct for us to refer to those cults of Babylon, Egypt and the rest as dead religions. Actually, they are not dead at all, for the echo of their ancient thunder is still to be heard reverberating in almost every form of faith existing today, and others add to their testimony. The days of the ancient East were numbered and the scepter of its power was bequeathed to western lands. Soon a new faith was to come, in which all the threads of ancient man's religion were to be gathered up, none being lost. Introduction to the Egyptian religion, shorter, pages 125 and 126. Nearly all of the Christian symbols in use today are of pagan origin. The evil eye, Parker, page 17. The chief masculine deity of every pagan nation on the face of the earth is in every case to be identified with the sun. Sun, law of all ages, Olcott, pages 141, 200 and 201. Our most important ecclesiastical feast days are in fact but survivals of ancient solar festivals. Ibid, page 227. From the foregoing, which treats merely of the more important solar festivals, it is clear that these products of paganism are as much in force at present from a symbolic point of view as they ever were and that Christianity countenances and in many cases has actually adopted and practices 
pagan rites whose heathen significance is merely lost sight of because attention is not called to the sources whence these rites have sprung. In short, sun worship, symbolically speaking, lies at the very heart of the great festivals which the Christian Church celebrates today, and these relics of heathen religion have, through the medium of their sacred rites, curiously enough blended with practices and beliefs utterly antagonistic to the spirit that prompted them. Ibid, page 248. Christianity was helpless before the Greek religion. The Church did everything it could to stamp out such pagan rites, but had to capitulate and allow the rites to continue with only the name of the local deity changed to some Christian saint's name. From the same popular sources came the Christian use of relics, religious tradition and myth Dr Edwin Goodenough, Professor of the History of Religion, Yale University, pages 56 and 57. The very images of the pagan gods were adopted as Christian. In some cases the adoption received no other disguise than to have the word saint placed in front of the god's name. In other cases the name was changed but the rites, symbols and processions continued as before. Zeus, A History of the Greek Religion, A.B. Cook, Cambridge University Press. This very scholarly four-volume work appears to have been repressed. It is to be found in the rare book room of the Library of Congress, but efforts to locate a purchasable set either in America or England have failed. Confiding then in the power of Christianity to resist the infection of evil and to transmute the very instruments and appendages of demon worship to an evangelical use, the rulers of the church from early times were prepared, should occasion arise, to adopt or imitate or sanction the existing rites and customs of the populace, as well as the philosophy of the educated class. Development of Christian Doctrine, Cardinal Newman, pages 372 and 37. The Cardinal follows this statement with a long list of such imports which he declares are of pagan origin but sanctified by their adoption into the Church. Through Europe, and especially in Rome, Christian churches are decorated with the signs of zodiac and with carvings of pagan gods and goddesses. Who would imagine that a religion so monstrous as that of the Egyptians should ever have been adopted by men professing Christianity, and that the extravagant notions of the most superstitious nation that ever was concerning their deities should be received among the sacred mysteries of the true religion? This, however, was done in the second age of the Church by the Gnostics. Antiquity explained, Father Montfaucon, 2, page 224. The Emperor Hadrian declared in a letter that the worshippers of Serapis are Christians, and some of the votaries to that deity call themselves bishops of Jesus Christ, id, loc, sit. The word Catholic was formerly an astrological term, Astrology and Religion Among the Greeks and Romans, Cumont, page 173. Catholicus was the Latin name of the Greek god Cosmos, who was worshipped as the universe deified and who was represented with hoofs, horns, a tail and a pitchfork and who was symbolised by a giant serpent with his tail in his mouth. The secret societies frankly admit that their religious rites and symbols come to them from Babylon and Egypt that they are the successors to Gnosticism and the ancient mysteries, and that only by a study of the religions of the East can their symbolism be understood. The sacred Rosicrucian ever-burning lamps have on them the twelve signs of the zodiac and the symbols of the seven planetary gods, the Rosicrucians, their rites and ceremonies, Jennings. Astrology and astrological concepts form the foundation of masonry and other secret societies. If some zealous vivisectionist were to attempt to cut away from the body of an animal as much in proportion as the science of astronomy, old meaning astrology, enters into the mysteries of Freemasonry, either ancient or modern, he would scarcely leave more than the tips of the ears and the tail. The same may with equal truth be said of all the ancient religious mysteries. 
Ancient Freemasonry, Frank C. Higgins, 32, page 177. The sun god as a disguise for Lucifer. In Babylonia, as well as in all pagan lands since that day, the sun god was represented as a bull or as a goat, hence the hoofs, horns and tail, and had titles clearly identifying him with Satan. One of the titles of Bel in Babylon was Enlil, a word which means Lord of Demons. The king claimed to be the earthly vicar or mouthpiece of the god, or at times even the god himself. Hence we find Isaiah referring to the king as Lucifer, son of the morning, Isaiah 14, 4-14. In Egypt all the gods were considered as but variant forms of the sun god Ra, who was again represented by the bull and the goat. One of his hieroglyphs was a serpent hanging over a circle. Another was a tail and mouth serpent. He was also symbolised by a lion and bore the titles Monster Serpent and Lord of Terror. In Medo-Persia, the sun god Mithras was represented as a bull, as a goat, as a lion and as a serpent. He was frequently represented as a lion-headed man encircled by the coils of a serpent and by the signs of the zodiac. In Greece, the sun god Zeus was pictured encircled by the signs of the zodiac and was represented by a bull, a goat, a lion and a serpent. All the gods of the East were imported into Rome. Mithraism became the official religion of Rome about the time of Christ. Like Mithras, Jupiter was represented as a bull and was pictured and circled by the twelve signs. The word Jupiter means day father and he was pictured with a pitchfork or lightning bolt in his hand. Serapis, a leading Roman sun god whose name apparently means sun bull or lord bull, was considered as the ruler of the zodiac. Throughout the East to this day and especially in India, the sun god is still represented as a bull and as a serpent and his titles clearly connect him with the devil. The Trail of the Serpent, Chapter 3, The Cross and Crucifixion Lucifer has from the beginning attempted to insinuate himself into the worship of God, to secure the veneration or worship of his images and idols, his rites and holy days. Among the more successful of such attempts has been the sanctifying of the cross, used as the image of the demon sun god from time immemorial. The cross as a pagan symbol. No symbol, either in art or in religion, is so universal as the cross, yet it is a mistake to suppose that the cross has only a Christian history. The ancient Phoenicians, Persians, Assyrians and Brahmins looked upon the cross as a holy symbol. Curiosities of popular customs, Walsh, art, cross. The cross has been adored from the remotest antiquity, the Story of Superstition, Waterman, page 161. It was worshipped in Babylon at least 1400 years before the birth of Christ. Ancient Seals of the Near East, Martin, Seal number 9. The cross has been revered by pagans since the dawn of history. The Cross in Tradition, History and Art, Seymour. The cross has been used both as a religious symbol and as an ornament from the dawn of man's civilization. India, Syria, Persia and Egypt have all yielded numberless examples. The use of the cross as a religious symbol in pre-Christian times and among non-Christian peoples may probably be regarded as almost universal, and in very many cases it was connected with some form of nature. It was used as a religious emblem in India and China at least ten centuries before the Christian era. Ensi, Brit, 11th edition, Art, Cross. In Egypt, the name of the cross was Kanob, and it was considered as an image of the sun. Both the Kan and the Ob of the word Kanob mean serpent in Egypt and throughout the East. The cross, ancient and modern, Blake, page 12, Worship of the Serpent, Dean. The Egyptians considered the serpent as an emblem of the sun and frequently compounded words for serpent with words for sun. The serpent was worshipped as the incarnation of wickedness and guile, and throughout the East it was considered as the incarnation of the sun. 
Serpent Worship, Wake, page 3. The serpent, the cross and the sun are ever pictured together in Egypt. The reason for the crosses becoming a sacred symbol is not hard to find. It became a symbol of the demon sun god Bel or Enlil, the lord of demons, because the reflection of the rays on the eyelids and eyelashes from any bright light form themselves into a cross. Sun law of all ages, Olcott, page 300. The evidence is unmistakable that the cross was worshipped as an idol or image of this deity from earliest times. The cross, moreover, had another closely related meaning to many pagan philosophers. It represented the four directions of space and was therefore symbolic of cosmos or the whole universe deified as God, the consecrated image of the supreme. Fundamental Principles, Nuttall, 91 and 92. One Egyptian text declares, O gods of the west, O gods of the east, O gods of the south, O gods of the north, for these who embrace the four quarters of the earth holy. Id, page 372. For this cosmic meaning, the cross was often combined with the circle or globe, both circle and the cross arms being pictured as serpents in Egypt. Worship of the Serpent, Dean, pages 117 and 118. Both the cross and the circle cross thus represented the sun and cosmos, which were in the final analysis considered as one, for everything in heaven above and in the earth beneath was considered as an emanation of the sun, flesh of his flesh. In Babylon, the hieroglyph for Ben Enlil consisted of a cross on top of a circle or globe. The cross, ancient and modern, Blake, page 15. The cross, in fact, was the Babylonian symbol for God, and it is frequently found on the heads of gods to distinguish them from other beings. The Palace of Minos, Sir Arthur Evans, page 514, Ward, Op, Sit, page 117. In Assyria, a cross before a name signified divinity, Nineveh, Layard, 2, page 153. In Egypt, the hieroglyph for the sun and for God was a cross, medieval number symbolism, Hopper, page 67. Ra was sometimes pictured holding a cross in one hand and a pitchfork in the other, Egyptian gods, shorter, page 6. Since the king-priest claimed to be the incarnation of and the earthly spokesman for the sun god, it is not surprising to find that the cross was also a symbol meaning priest, Bull Standards of Egypt, J.E.A. 19, pages 46 and 47. Bonner believes that the upright serpent crossed by three horizontal serpents represented the cosmic god Chnubis as the ruler of the universe and that this symbol is related to the Gnostic SSS across a bar. Magical Amulets, University of Michigan Press, page 25. In Medo-Persia, the cross was sacred in Mithraism and the crossed wafers are regularly found in Mithraic altars. Mithraism, Cumont. Many Persian kings had their tombs excavated in the form of a cross. A History of Ancient Persia, Rogers, page 143. In Greece, the cross was a sacred symbol. The Story of Superstition, Waterman, page 146. Diana of the Ephesians is sometimes pictured with a cross or crosses atop her head, and one of the titles of Diana was Lucifera, female Lucifer. On the island of Crete, the shrine of the snake goddess consisted of nothing but a cross on an altar. Wonders of the Past, Hamilton, 1, page 59. In Rome, the Vestal Virgins wore the cross and symbols of immorality. Museum of Antiquity, Yagi, page 98 and 116. Venus, the goddess of love and immorality, was symbolised by the circle cross. In Buddhist countries, the cross has been revered from earliest times. Land of the Eye, H. Davis, page 45. In India, the cross was sacred to Hindu gods long before Christ. The cross, Seymour, page 10. Among the Druids, the bull, the serpent and the cross were everywhere revered. The Veil of Isis, read pages 52 and 96. Throughout the Americas, the cross was everywhere sacred to the sun god. Conquest of Mexico, Prescott, 3, page 
page 383 and 384.